So welcome everyone. If you've just jumped on, we are uh, on a Kenora webinar today talking about recreational therapy and supports. So let's bring on our first expert provider. So Tanya, I welcome you. Let's start with you. Hi Tanya. Hi, how are you going? Tanya, um, you're from Together We Can International based in Adelaide, South Australia. Um, if you wanted to start off by sharing a little bit about yourself, maybe what's inspired you to work in this space. Um, and I want to hear about these great respite camps that you guys put on and some of the absolutely, benefits. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so my background is 20 years plus employment services, uh, DES, a disability employment service provider, as well as the, the parents next. I'm also a qualified cardiac nurse and youth worker. So uh, a quite a diverse um, career. Obviously, it's all been about wanting to support and help other people, hence why I got into um, the NDIS space. So um, our director, Kath, is a, a long time, long term uh, friend as well as work colleagues, uh, a colleague, and both of us uh, have had personal lived experience going through the process as a parent of a, a child with a late diagnosis um, with Asperger's and ADHD. So uh, as we were both um, navigating our way on getting NDIS and getting the supports in place, we realised that there wasn't uh, any much or if any um, supports available for young teens and young adults, specifically under the ASD banner. So your ABIs, neurodiverse, um, you know, Asperger's and, and ADHD, hence Together We Can was, was born. Um, I love what I do. We, um, we're we an organisation with integrity and uh, we stay in our lane, so to speak, um, and we don't support participants with physical or complex or high needs. So um, yeah, it's it's fantastic. Uh, we also do our one-on-one -on -one mentoring, once again, for uh, your tweens, teens, and uh, young adults. And that's about building social participation and, and uh, you know, social skills, which works really well. A lot of our mentors are very young, energetic. They know all the latest TikToks. Uh, they're not crusty old Facebook users like myself. Um, you know, they're into sports and they're really able to make that connection very quickly, build that rapport and that trust. And that's really what it's all about, is making sure that that participant, participant feels comfortable, um, feels heard and has a voice. The thing we have is our social groups. So we have gender specific social groups. Our gal power group is, is obviously related to females. Uh, and our new one that we're rolling out called Young Guns, this is for our uh, young male tween teens up to about the age of 17, 18 for that social skill building. Um, you know, they, they get to, to um, tell their story, where they're at, you know, talk about uh, social media etiquette, cyber safety, um, you know, building friendships, maintaining friendships and relationships and then having a good game of pool, pizza and, and that sort of thing. That's all inclusive as well. And if we can just quickly just touch on the, um, sounds like already you've mentioned a few recreational activities that yes. you do, but yes. just in particular, just quickly give our members today a quick overview of those recreational camps that you mm -hmm. offer for teens with ASD. It would be really interesting for members to hear. For sure. So our camps are a three-day, two-night camps. We're currently running them at Clayton Bay. Um, we do have a new uh, location at Barmera, Lake Bonnie, which we're running next weekend. So this is a, a one-to-two ratio, and it's all about inclusion, having fun, stepping outside of their comfort zone, uh, trying new experiences, building those social skills uh, with that support of their mentor, but the other participants as well. Everything's included, the pick-up, drop-off activities, meals, accommodation. Um, we have our own speedboat, so they get get to go, uh, you know, tubing, wakeboarding, kneeboarding, uh, we've got paddle boards, we've got a jet ski, um, you know, we have very strict guidelines as far as water safety, they're to wear life jackets, um, as well as our land-based activities, team cricket, um, we do our own uh, Twiki's Got Talent if they're up for it as well. So it's all about that social experience and they're getting that therapy organically in a non-therapeutic setting. So they're meeting new people, they're trying different things and that's why it's so successful. Um, and we do run the, those as day trips. 
if they're not keen or haven't been away from their family overnight, just to give them a taste of whether that's something that uh, they, they will benefit from. Excellent. That's fantastic. Yeah, and they <laughs> to the second, I think. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that, Tanya. No worries. Um, perfect. So, Carlin, we might bring you on next. Um, welcome, Carlin. Carlin is from Play Anything. Uh, he's a music therapist. And I am such a believer in music and art being a universal language. Hello. Yes. Thank you for the big wave. Carlin, tell us about, uh, about a little bit about your studies as a music therapist um, and the vision behind Play Anything. Um, maybe even show us some of the fab instruments that you have there at the studio and some of the, the benefits of music therapy. Hi, Tina. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it's lovely to be here with all of you with a really awesome group of providers doing awesome engaging uh really really meaningful things for participants so yeah I, i'm a registered music therapist so i've um completed a master's of music therapy at western sydney university and uh i've got a small team of music therapists here in newcastle new south wales and we provide music therapy in-house at our studio here in newcastle and we also provide home visits school visits and we do a lot in the telehealth space as well that's actually an area that we're really passionate about. Um, I know that uh, with lots of Zoom meetings and things over when we're in lockdown and things, uh, sometimes that was a bit tricky for all of us, but uh, I still really think that one of the silver linings of that was that people who couldn't necessarily access face-to-face -face services were able to access telehealth. And um, yeah, we found that that's been a really great option for some of our participants. So yeah, we work in that space as well. Uh, and yeah, so look, music therapy, if you don't know what that is, uh, we're a registered support provider through NDIS and music therapy is delivered by a trained clinician. So music therapists have attended um, university for a number of years and completed a master's degree. And the reason is that we want to use evidence-based practice where we're working with participants to make sure that we're um, working on their therapeutic goals and that we're aligning with what they want to achieve. So. I think one of the great things about music therapy is that it's really strengths based um, and I love seeing how when we incorporate music into our work um, it's actually really motivating it's really inspiring so that's something that I love doing and seeing in my work that um, music's a really powerful tool to uh, to work on those goals that we work on so some of the things that we we tend to focus on with things like emotional regulation uh, social skills and communication your gross and fine motor skills so we can actually cover a lot of areas through different evidence-based music activities um, and I won't talk too long because I know I've got lots of providers to get to today and lots of questions um, but I, I do have lots of instruments I'm in a, I'm in sort of the yes, main area of my fun. studio I might just see if I can turn my screen um, I've got a really interesting instrument here to my left so uh, I'll come and just give you a little rendition of this is a Gucheng it's a Chinese harp. So uh, this instrument, yeah, it's, um, I really like it because you don't have to have any musical training or knowledge to get a beautiful sound out of it. And in music therapy, you don't need to have any musical training to benefit from music therapy. Um, what we do is try to make it accessible and inclusive for everyone. So this instrument, you can play any strings and it all sounds really lovely. So I'm just gonna play a few notes. Wow, so, fantastic. Hopefully that came through okay. We have all your traditional instruments here, like we've got, you know, drums and piano, guitars, plenty, but um, we like to have things that are a little bit uh, less your kind of standard traditional instruments, just to let people explore some different options. So yeah, we try to cater to all different interests and yeah, we work with all ages and abilities. So we've got a pretty broad selection of things that we use here. Excellent, love it. Looks like so much fun. I am. Um... It is, and you get to. It's. It, we kind of call it like a bit of a covert therapy because you're working on those goals, but it's also you're just having fun. So it doesn't really feel like hard work. Amazing, and you know, I think you make a really good point there about how all uh, yourself and you know your team are actually qualified therapists, and you've studied very well. I think that's one of the things that some people can get confused about with non-clinical supports that. Um, 
don't fall under that allied health umbrella that, you know, potentially these therapists are not qualified, where in fact, it's really rather the opposite. They're very qualified um, and they've studied in their field. So, you know, I really want people to take away today that one of the things you should be looking for when looking for a non-clinical support is you should still be asking for those qualifications. It, would you agree, Carlin? Uh, a thousand percent. Yeah, I think it's really important, you know, in terms of safety to make sure that you're going to have a provider that is safe um, and a provider that's knowledgeable and that's going to actually help you with those goals. Um, yeah, I think it's really important. And yeah, always make sure you, you look up and find somebody that's going to help you address those needs appropriately. Exactly, yeah. with the correct qualifications. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much, Carlin. Thank you no for problem. sharing that. Awesome. Thanks, um, next, Simona, I would love to bring you on and I'd love for you to share about uh, indigo art therapy. I know uh, art therapy, I've heard, is extremely beneficial for uh, participants potentially who are nonverbal as well. Would you like to um, tell us maybe about some of those benefits for um, that type of diagnosis? I'm Simona. Thank you, Tam. And founded um, Indigo. I've been working in it for about 17 years, um, lecturing here and overseas as well. So Indigo is a creative therapies group. So we offer all the different um, creative therapies and we work with DHHS and player managers and support coordinators. And we're working with people, um, supporting people ADHD on the spectrum, nonverbal, as you said, but also mental health issues as well, um, individually in groups and also dyadic work. So if there is a family group um, or a couple of people that need to come together to work through um, issues, whether it's due to meltdowns, we've got a lot of people on the spectrum that are coming here. So it might be about using the app to give strategies to the parents or give strategies to teachers about behaviours of kids that are on the spectrum and how they can make it easier and more functional behaviour as well. Um, and the intention is to use whether it's textures or sewing um, or plasticine. I've got lots of different instruments and tools and materials around me because if I can just explain a little bit about how the art therapy works. The, in terms of a nonverbal client, it's there can be nonverbal in a number of different ways. It could be somebody who actually doesn't have the ability to talk. So because I really believe that everyone has something to say, um, but that words are just not always the easiest option. So if somebody doesn't have the ability to talk, they're able to use all of these materials to express what's happening inside of them. They might not have the ability from birth, they might not have the ability because they've got an ABI, an acquired brain injury, whether it's a stroke or some other um, acquired brain injury. Um, it might be because they might have been through something that is too traumatic. It might be because the event that took place was um, in their pre-verbal stage, so they won't be actually be able to have the frames of reference and the vocabulary to put their experience in a sequential, logical, chronological order that helps make sense of things on the logical side. So what the art therapy does is it integrates the right side of the brain, which is all creativity, a more holistic look, as well as the um, left side of the brain also. Um, and it helps express those emotions that perhaps somebody on the spectrum or somebody that is a child that's having the meltdowns um, is having. So we might be creating a volcano and watching what happens if we stuff the volcano with all of the emotions that are inside and then watching it pour out at the top. So the art becomes a third partner in the therapy process. So there's the art maker who doesn't need to have any prior art experience. Um, there is the art therapist who also is a qualified art therapist, masters um, qualified. And there is the art that you can dialogue with as well. Um, it's not about being perfect. There's no right and wrong way to do the art. It's about the process that we go through as well. Um, uh, there's things like sewing. Now, I wonder if you can actually see, I'm not sure, I've tried to remove my um, background, but it's not working. So we'll see if we oh, can okay. just 
Can you see? Yes, you can see yes. that. So yes. that is a heart. Yes. That is a gun. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is this was made by a person with mental health. Oops. One second. Can't That's get okay. it again. You did see it. But, it was yeah. very well drawn. Very good. It, well, actually, actually, it's again, it's not about the um piece that's drawn but rather the process so that person has borderline personality personality issues which means that there's a lot of social issues and social interactions so we try to work with boundaries so that boundary is actually made of you know when you go to a doctor if there's a broken arm and they plaster your hand so it's chicken wire with plaster in front of it and these are the things that they feel need to build and support and scaffold their boundaries so we can work psychodynamically and we can also work, um, there's two different ways of working with art therapy. It's art-based therapy. So just the repetitive nature of sewing can be therapeutic. The repetitive nature and the safe nature of things like um, plasticine can be therapeutic. Um, or there's the therapy-based art. So you're bringing your issues or you're bringing your dreams or you're bringing your emotions, your trauma um, the frustrations of not being of having social anxiety, um, of not having friends because it's so hard to connect to the art making space, and you're expressing it that way. And the art allows the art maker to view their life a little bit differently, reframe what's happening, and see maybe there's another option of behaving, of interacting, and it's a really safe space. They don't need to give eye contact. Somebody on the spectrum is not necessarily going to be giving you that eye contact that you need in traditional talking modalities. It can, it's all done through the art and organically, as one of the other providers said, I think it was Tanya who was talking about the group work, where just connecting with these people is so therapeutic and the gems that come out between the different um, group participants I feel honoured. I feel like I should be, um, uh, you know, thanking them for everything that comes up in that group as well. So that's in group work and, and there's also individual um, work as well. I'm that's also amazing. aware of the time. No, no, <laughs> no, no, that's incredible. Thank you so much. And again, it is another evidence-based therapy, yeah. you know, as, as as much fun and my son herself has done it and he loves it and loved it. Yeah. As much fun as it, as it is, it is, again, evidence-based therapy and a really valid option um, for yes. participants that, it's you know. It's so, mm. um, so much so that um, the head of Creative Victoria announced, I don't know if the the policy I'm assuming has been announced since then, but he announced for um, art and music therapy that they're putting more funds to that because they've seen the evidence of um, the benefits of all these creative therapies that are me really making a difference. And from a neuroscientific point of view, we're tapping into completely different um, lobes, the frontal, the cortex, all of that is is there. It's, yeah. It's amazing. It's very exciting. We love what we do. And we've also got a <laughs> team it. here as well. <laughs> love it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so yes. much, Simona. Thank Pleasure. You. <laughs> um, Dean, we might um, invite you on if that's okay. If you want to turn on your camera, uh, Dean is from Path of the Horse and he is an equine therapist. Hello, hello. Dean, please share. I know equine therapy is potentially a therapy that uh, not as many people understand or, you know, um, know potentially what they might do in an equine therapy session. So please share with us all, enlighten us. Uh, thank you, Tamina. I, I'm just sitting here noticing how wonderful the offer is from our previous speakers. And just, yeah, what Simona was saying really resonated. I love that, experimenting with things. Um, equine therapy can be a very confusing term. You know, when people say, Dean, what do you do? I say, oh, I'm a psychotherapist, but I also do equine therapy. I go, what, therapy for horses? And I say, well, no, we, we work with <laughs> our people. And it's a confusing term and a confusing sector of, um, of supports. Um, I just want to try and clarify what it actually is for people. So I think you yeah. mentioned earlier about credentials being important. So there is offers of equine-assisted learning that you'll see and equine-assisted therapy. Now, they're very, very different. We offer both with different practitioners. An equine assist, EAP is an equine assisting psychotherapist. So it's it's actually someone who is mental mental health trained. They will be uh, a member. I'm a member of PACFA as a psychotherapist. We have codes of ethics and 
and standards that are very, very important. So I think people, if they're looking for a provider in our, in our sector of the world, the equine therapy, really look closely at the training and the skills and the professional codes of conduct that do apply to the providers. Um, equine assisted learning, all of those practitioners should have qualified in proper equine assisted learning training. What they won't do when they stay in their lane is explore developmental narratives. They, they are not, um, they're not trauma informed practitioners. And even with an equine assisted psychotherapist, what other subset of skills do they have? So when we work with them, um, with our NDIS participants, and we see many you know, of, of all ages and abilities, um, we're obviously informed by their goals. So are the goals, and it, it, oh, the range of things, confidence building, social skills, um, being relational, and noticing nonverbal communications and noticing the other, it becomes really, really interesting work with the support of horses. Um, we aren't a ridden focused based therapy. It's about relational stuff, about noticing. Probably the most wonderful gift the horses that can bring to anyone I see and also work with a lot of veterans and, and people with trauma um, is finding calm and self-regulating. The horses are masters at it. So when we invite someone to, to, to meet a horse or meet a herd, we're obviously very... We're very aware of how they're feeling, constantly tracking them, what's safe and comfortable for them. Everything's an invitation. Some are love animals. Most people that come and seek out equine therapy work have a love for animals. And we sort of work on that and, and then eventually could work on what goals that client needs. Is it confidence building? Well, what would it be like to be close to a 550 kilogram quarter horse, you know, um, what would it be like to actually lead one to show leadership or, and when they're doing that to bring their voice and, um, you know, bring some leadership qualities out and build those confidence and techniques. There's so many things that we can offer. And I think one of the most important things for the work I do is we do it in a non-clinical environment. You know, so many NDIS participants we work with, children and adults. If I was to sit in a room and take a room-based, very evidence-based approach to our work, there was no way that I would assist someone to work on their goals. If we do it not as effectively, if we go outside, we're surrounded by the bush, we've got nature, we've got the environment supporting us, and then we're with horses. It's another relationship in the therapy mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. And I've had instances where, you know, working with NDIS participants and they could be grooming a horse. They're on one side of a horse. You know, if, they're, if they've, they've got ASD, they're on one side of a horse, I'm on the other. And these conversations start. And it's interesting to notice, oh, okay, well, that's all right. We're avoiding the eye contact. We've got this lovely big horse there grooming in between us. And, you know, we're always curious because we see lots of labels and I'm sure everyone here sees lots of labels on people. We hold them very lightly. Um, mm -hmm. Who are you? Um, how do you experience the world? What's a way mm -hmm. of working mm -hmm. it safe and comfortable for you? People who provide equine therapy services generally have some very, very well-regulated and calm horses. Um, those who might come from the racing industry to our place go, Dean, do you give your horses drugs? Because they're also calm. <laughs> <laughs> Dean, I might want to, um, I just want to ask you something, because I think mm. you did make a good point earlier. So, um, you know, it sounds amazing. You're in this open space in nature and it, it is in a very non-clinical environment or setting, as you would say. I think it's important to, uh, for everyone to note, though, as well, that um, all of the therapists here today do work closely with your clinical supports. So even though you are in such a non-clinical environment and you provide a different type of support and therapy, 
it is still a collaborative effort from your existing mm. support team and and with you guys as well even though you don't necessarily fall under that umbrella can you give an example of where you work really closely with clinical supports or existing supports to sort of all achieve that same goal yeah often with with the with the with the participants permission um or maybe at their suggestion they say oh would you talk to my psychologist or my ot um you know, or I might raise that. And so what would it be like if we sort of collaborated to try and work on your best outcome, but only with their permission and consent, of course. And other times, I, I don't know others' experience, but I'm seeing a lot of collaboration on care team meetings now for a lot of my NDIS participants where we get, you know, maybe five or six people providing that support. What are we noticing? What are we working on? What are we finding is useful? Um, those sort of collaborations, I, I think, are an important part of the system. Yeah, amazing. Thank you. Dean, I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to cut you there. Okay. I am aware of time. We could, I, I could talk forever about horses, as I'm, as I'm sure you could as well. But we, as mentioned, we will do a little bit more of a deeper dive into these therapies later on. But thank you so much, Dean. Last but not least, please welcome Peter Wilson from Emer uh, D2, who offers immersion therapy. Pete, I'll uh, hand it over to you. Uh, I have, uh, what we do is very visual, so I have put together a, um, a quick little presentation, but I think it covers uh, most of those things. Uh, so tell me if this is coming up, hopefully. Yes, we can see it. Thumbs up. Yes. Yeah. And feel free to ask any questions. So yeah, my name's Pete. I'm the Managing Director at Determatur. I'm also the founder of Immersion Therapy. And so I'm actually, uh, and like these other guys, our service is actually delivered by clinicians. I'm, even though I'm the founder of this service, I'm no longer qualified to deliver it. I'm not a clinician. I purely invented this service and our company and our services are bit built on lived experience. So this kind of gives a bit of an overview of what immersion therapy is. And so Determined 2 is a multiple winning, winning service provider. And like I said, we're built on the foundations of lived experience. We really pride ourselves uh, on co-design in service delivery, which is working with people uh, to understand what they want to get out of our services. Uh, immersion therapy is a biopsychosocial service, uh, and so what that means is it can be beneficial physically, mentally, and socially. Uh, the qualifications of our uh, staff, are, uh, primary qualification is an allied health professional, our staff in Adelaide are accredited exercise physiologists, uh, and then they have gone through a specialty training uh, in immersion therapy. And so they have to manage and adhere both standards for immersion therapy and the governing body of the uh, health profession. Uh, this is our team. So in Adelaide, uh, we've got a, a pretty hard hitting, dynamic and diverse team uh, split between male, female, ages. Uh, also, we've got uh, Mandarin speaking staff and Vietnamese speaking staff. There's some really common misconceptions with immersion therapy. And uh, the big one is that we're teaching people to scuba dive uh, or scuba diving in a swimming pool. Uh, and that's not true. And uh, also immersion therapy is beyond somebody's capabilities. Um, the reality is we work with uh, the youngest in our service is about eight, uh, all the way through to people in their seventies. Uh, we have people of very high and very complex needs uh, with people with very little needs and, and certainly people with no physical uh, impairment at all, uh, might be mental health. Uh, there are details on our website to delve into that. Uh, with us and like what the others have talked about, um, integrating into mainstream therapy evidence base is really important and we recognise that many years ago. Uh, so we set out on a mission in partnership with the University of South Australia and some of our leading doctors to start to gather that evidence base. And so there's been three major studies completed now. One was just finding out if the service was therapeutic. And if it was therapeutic, um, you know, what was the likely uh, uh, outcomes of that? Uh, then a three-year qualitative study. So if the academics thought what we were doing was therapeutic, what did our customers think? So that was with a sample size of about 60 active participants over about three years. And uh, it was quite interesting. That one surprised the clinicians and the academics. They were thinking on oh, the physical benefit, but the psychosocial benefits actually 
was more reported in about, uh, I think it was about 75, 80% of participants. Uh, we then also made the move to integrate the exercise physiology. So we looked at that and how would that impact on the non-clinical, uh, being that these were clinicians, how would that impact on the non-clinical aspects of our service? Uh, that research has led into uh, clinical trials, which is starting this year. Uh, so this is quite a significant clinical trial. Uh, and we're, of course, looking at some other um, uh, aspects. Um, so with us, like I said, it's quite visual. And uh, if you guys give me a couple of minutes just to show you some examples of what that might look like. Uh, so this first one is a lady who lives with MS. Uh, you can see from this image, she uses a wheelchair. Uh, she has quite significant mobility restrictions. Uh, and this kind of demonstrates what we're able to do and how to support this person coming into our service with physical goals. Wow. How how heavy is that? Um, it's a float. So the actual resistance is in the downward rather than the upward. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Wow. That's incredible. And that's just in one session. Yeah, so that's important to note uh, that that's across 45 minutes, not 45 mm -hmm. sessions. That's the beginning of a session to the end of a session. Mm -hmm. And she would report those ongoing range of movement improvements for about two days to three days. And that's mm -hmm. pretty typical for someone with range of motion, movement issues, and a physical goal in our service. We tailor the service to their physical goals. Uh, this is another example of somebody, this actually person was referred for mental health that found that physical activity was something that they enjoyed more uh, and that physical activity improved their mental health. So we designed a program for them. They self-reported the benefits because after participating for about 12 weeks, they could get the rabbit out from under their bed without calling their son. So that was pretty cool. Wow. Uh, this is a person with quite significant physical uh, impairment, uh, however, does not have a physical goal. And so this person has a soca social goal. In fact, when we'd met this lady, she had not left her home in three years. Um, her pain specialist recommended her to us because she pretty much tried everything else uh, and nothing was working for her. So we really tailored the service to be fun and activity based. And here she's shooting rubber ducks with a rubber gun. Uh, within two weeks, she was at the Fringe Festival. Within 12 months, she went to the Billie Eilish concert in Perth. And last night she went to Ed Sheeran here, and tonight she's going to the Snoop Dogg concert. So, <laughs> so uh, that, that's all from shooting ducks with a gun. So uh, it's it's wow. pretty fun. And of course, she's in an environment with, regardless of that activity, it's against resistance. So she's getting a physical activity. She's reduced her pain medications almost to zero with her, her guidance of a pain specialist, um, and has goals to get off that altogether. Uh, this is a good example of somebody who, because um, most people look at what we do and go, there's no way I can do that, be underwater. Uh, this gentleman actually, uh, uh, he lived his whole life able body, uh, later in life, uh, quite a very significant Parkinson's disease, very aggressive version of Parkinson's. His neurophysio referred him to us. Uh, but what was interesting when we met him is he hadn't been in the water since he was 10, uh, because he had a, an absolute uh, uh, off the chart level fear of water from a near drowning experience as a child uh, and had not even been in a bathtub, believe it or not. And uh, here he is. This is about after 12 months of working with him, uh, doing barrel rolls in the scooter underwater. And uh, we actually had his son over from Melbourne recently and he was standing on the edge of the pool crying. And we were like, what's the matter, mate? Because I've never seen my dad in a swimming pool. That's um, amazing. And, and now his dad's planning a snorkeling trip to Fiji. Uh, a snorkeling trip, wow. You know, uh, uh, here's another way of using games. So this is a dude that uh, uh, unfortunately uh, lost three of his limbs in an accident. And, and for him, going down the pub and playing darts on a Wednesday was what he'd like to do before his accident. And so we come up with this game underwater of darts for him where he can get up out of his power chair, uh, be upright, play this game of darts. And the, the goal of this game is to hit them on the tip and catch them. 
And I think the world record for that is about eight with the footy five minutes, but we've counted about 1,500 repetitions in a session. So that gives a uh, visual uh, different ways that we can use physical, mental, and uh, social ways to accommodate our service to our physical goals. And yeah, there's lots more on our um, Amazing. website. Amazing. Thank you so much, Peter. That's amazing and, and well done on founding, uh, you know, a different type of therapy that people seem uh, really benefiting from. That, that's awesome. You know, something that I will um, just maybe ask all of our providers and open it up to them and because I am conscious there are some questions coming through too. But, you know, there is a commonality that there is an element of fun, um, lightness to non-clinical supports. As an open question to you guys, what do you think it is about non-clinical supports that uh, is offered that potentially sometimes clinical supports don't? Where, where's the gap that they are filling there? I'm happy to talk from personal experience. I'm not a clinician, like I said. Um, my staff are all clinicians. I think what's really important when we think about this is that I, in, my, in my personal experience working with therapists in the past, is a really good practitioner, someone that can make the, cl the clinical invisible. Um, what's really important to me as a person with disability and my interactions with my therapists is that I'm, they're relatable, that they understand me, that they give me voice, that they give me choice and control, and that it's about me and what I want to achieve, um, not what's on a piece of paper and a square box that I have to somehow try and fit into. And so I think, um, like I said, from personal experience with me, and I know with my staff, I are clinicians, uh, but the clinical aspect of their qualification is invisible in our service delivery. It's something that they're required to do that sits in the back that underpins the, the benefit of the service. Um, but as far as the interaction with our customer um, or our participants, um, for them it's almost an invisible component. Perfect. Simona, what, what are your thoughts on the the things that sort of, you know, non-clinical supports can offer compared to more traditional clinical supports. There's a bit of a gap that they're filling there. Would you agree? Um, yeah, I would absolutely agree that there is a way, I think all of us have been saying as well, it's about sitting together. That I think it's the choice and the control and the fact that it sits in the participant's lap as opposed to a clinician um, diagnosing and prescribing it's this pill and it's this amount of, you know it's funny I was at a conference recently and they said how good it would, it would be and I think overseas are actually doing this already that they can prescribe bushwalking or as Peter Wilson was saying you know to to get into the water I think that that choice and that control and that self-empowerment aspect of knowing that I have the resources inside I just need the right language to be able to access it. And don't dismiss me just because I've lost a limb, just because I've had an ABI, just because um, I've got an ABI. One of our therapists this morning sent me a, a song that one of the um, participants has just done. And the power, and this person has had a stroke, very limited verbal, completely wheelchair bound, but the power within, um, especially if they do still have some cognitive skills as well, is outstanding. And I think it's that it's focusing on the fact that the participant has the answers. They really do. We've got to trust that. Yeah. Love it. Thank you. And Dean, I can see you've got your hand up. Tanya, we'll get to you shortly as well. And then we'll get to some questions, guys. Dean, and what, what would you like to add to that? I can't add much to Simone's lovely words. But Peter said something that I thought was just spot on when he said, make therapy invisible. And I kind mm. of, and I think having done years of room based work and, and now mostly working outside with the support of 10 wonderful horses in the environment, you know, we, we, we try and make therapy invisible. It, it, it is, you know, if you say to some people, oh, come along, we're doing therapy, there'll be mm. a resistance. But I think it's interesting what this panel offers is non-clinical in the sense it's different, it's new, it's not just CBT, it's not just room-based stuff. And I often find my experience with a lot of NDIS participants is the sharing and the feelings come 
when they're doing, when they're engaged yeah. in something. I, it's, mm -hmm. I find that all the time. I wouldn't be able to do that in a clinical traditional room-based approach, but we're out there with the horses, something they might be doing, engaged, and something might be grooming or walking. The conversation starts. So I'll just offer that as well. Yeah, amazing. Tanya, any any last words? Anything you wanted to add to that, or it's all been yes. wonderful? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I will be I will be brief. Um, in relation to the, I suppose the cohort that uh, that we support, um, because you can't see a neurodiverse, they don't want to be put into the same box as people that have that physical or complex needs, and they really struggle with that. Um, and and that's where you, I suppose, your invisible therapy comes in because we make it fun and inclusive, and they're spending time with people that are like minded. Yes, someone that's fits under that the ASD banner they all have their their different uh, quirks and habits and and strengths and and weaknesses and they're able to complement each other without them realizing that they're doing it so that's where that organic therapy um, it happens and you know like I said it's it's about trust feeling comfortable um, and knowing that they're not being judged they're not being picked on they're not being bullied because there's people that are in, you know, that same age category in that cohort that, you know, have similar interests or dislikes mm. and so forth. So that's why it works. Can I just add something, Tam? I think all of us, what we do is our modalities bypass the verbal filter. And when you're sitting with a psychologist, or I mean, I, I we work as psychologists and psychiatrists and all of them, but when you're sitting with a traditional um, verbal modality, you can choose your conscious mind chooses everything. What's happening and what's common amongst all of us is it's we're, we're accessing the subconscious and our behaviour is informed by the subconscious more than the conscious often. So I think that's, uh, you know, it would be amazing to have us all in the one room. You've been amazing, all of you. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I agree. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Now, I am aware that we are at time. We did have a bit of a delayed start. So if uh, you guys are uh, happy just to answer a couple of questions, quick questions and then we'll absolutely wrap it up. Um, Lisa, were there any really uh, some questions coming through? I could see the chat going off. I think for most of them, at the first, I thank you again for all your wonderful inputs. I've learned so much. Um, so um, most of them have been based around whether your services are available in other states. <laughs> <laughs> and I know some of you might do um, telehealth or whatnot. Um, some of you cannot, like Peter, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, yes, yeah, Simona, um, do you? I know you do a little bit of that, yeah. Yes, yeah, so we're headquartered in St Kilda in Victoria, but we have also um, someone in Queensland. We've got somebody in. Um, uh, Perth, Western Australia, Margaret River, um, and also in Geelong back in Victoria as well. But as the needs arise, we work out. So if there's something that you are after, you can um, contact us on the website. And we definitely work, yeah, we work local and overseas with telehealth as well. And Peter, you know, for your therapy, um, are you just based in SA and do you have other partners you work with in other states and cities? Yeah, so immersion therapy, uh, again, it was an accidental therapy in the beginning. We created it based on lived experience and something cool we thought we'd like to do that then became a therapy. And uh, so we've registered our trademarks in Australia, the USA, the EU, the UK, so we've made a pretty big statement. Immersion therapy is world first, and we want to get immersion therapy to as many people as possible. Uh, what that means for people right now, if they did want to participate, we do have people travel from interstate and we can support them. We recognise that's not ideal. Um, so this year we have plans and we're certainly, it's been a long journey to get here. Of course, lots of T's to cross and I's to dot. Uh, we have plans to start one in Melbourne, in Victoria later this year, uh, Sydney sometime short after that. Um, but we have a rollout plan of 10 locations over the next five years. And so that's really a plan that's starting this year. Uh, and, and is in the very early phases of kicking off. So I would say watch this space. Uh, but uh, like Simona said, you know, if it's if it's something that people want in their area, um, of course, where the demand is might help decide the focus mm -hmm. of our attention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have uh, do you have partners in other states? So or are there maybe physios or other like exercise physiologists who are doing similar work with you, like you? There is literally no one else in the world that does what we do. 
Um, oh, wow. Well done. Course. Well done, yeah. Peter. <laughs> the emergency therapy specialist piece is obviously has to be uh, very specifically trained because of the environment we're in. Scuba diving as a recreational hobby, just to let you know, is one of the most dangerous and extreme sports on the planet, uh, up there with skydiving and perhaps more so. Uh, and by nature that we're using that equipment, we're not scuba diving, but we're using that equipment in, a, in an environment that's therapeutic uh, and a control setting, but it is still very dangerous. So inadvertently we've created perhaps the world's most dangerous therapy. And so as you can imagine for us, moving fast is not that important. Moving safely, moving appropriately yes. as, as people. So I would certainly discourage people from attempting to try and replicate what they see we do because it is very dangerous uh, and lots of things could go wrong. Um, there's lots of policy and procedure, like we talk about that clinical type stuff that sits in the background. Uh, medical standards, we've got some of the most senior doctors in Australia sitting in, on a panel that underpin what the safety of what we do. Uh, and a lot of work's gone into the uh, training standards and operational standards to ensure that people are actually safe in that environment. Right, actually, Peter, I think maybe, um... Um, I think you've made a really interesting point that, in fact, uh, your type of immersion therapy is the scuba type with the breathing apparatus, right? Whereas, because there's a lot of talk of immersion therapy done by other allied health, and it is different from that. That's what you're saying. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't know why, but Wikipedia picked up afterwards. Uh, so at the time when we launched it, there wasn't such a thing. But there is a psychological, uh, delivered by psychologist immersion therapy, where they immerse somebody into a fear or a phobia to help it's them work through that. Um, we're immersion as in, it's like, think about the best thing you can compare us to is like hydrotherapy, but we're yes. doing underwater. Uh, we also say we take the vanilla out of therapy, which means it's actually hydrotherapy that's fun to do. Uh, it's most of the time we get the same thing, young kids. <laughs> that, that a different really type hard. of hydrotherapy, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's hydrotherapy, but fully immersed. And uh, so the qualifications and skills of the people need to be part of that. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we've got young people as well on the spectrum and their parents talk about having to drag them to any type of physical activity, like physio or, or EP or to the gym or to the pool. And the kids just don't like it. Whereas with us, they've got their bags packed the night before and they're harassing their parents. <laughs> like, Come on, they can't wait to go underwater. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And so, and what about you, Dean? You've got partners across the uh, country or you can refer um, folks who aren't in your st local state? Sure, I've come over the six years that our charity has been running to have many, have trained with many wonderful people in other states. If people get in contact with us, I'm happy to plug them in. But again, if you're looking at an equine therapy provider, really scrutinise their training and their offer. And are they a member of a professional association for the work? Mm, good. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Tanya, your camps, are they just in South Australia at the moment? I know um, camps for um, uh, autistic children and teens are really quite popular these days. Mm. Uh, currently, yes, only in SA. Um, I think there is a view down the track to expand nationally. When that happens, who knows? <laughs> but currently, yes, we're only offering the, the respite camps in, in South Australia. Right. No worries. Was there any other quick questions? Or I am conscious we are pretty much at time. Um, we will reach out to any other questions online, and I'm sure, as per normal, there are some questions that do come through after the webinar. Pete, you just wanted to say something. I see your hand up. I had a question for Dean. I was talking to a neuroscientist about uh, different therapies, and I was talking about equine. I just wanted to pick your brains to validate their comments was around uh, there were only two animals on planet Earth that they felt. So these guys, these scientists, academics measure people's brain waves. And they were saying there were two animals on planet Earth that operate on the same wavelength as humans, and that's dogs and horses. And that's why, uh, you know, in that setting, in that therapeutic setting, that dogs and horses can read the emotion by that subconscious uh, what's going on with the person and that's why they're really good. I was just wondering your thoughts or input around that. Yeah, Peter, I've heard the same thing. Um, things happen during the course of work uh, um, with at the path of the horse that I honestly can't explain. Um, a horse can pick up emotion. Uh, obviously, they live in a state of awareness. They're a prey animal, so they always want to know they're safe. Um, but they seem to pick, I've got one horse that I take my sadness to if I'm ever sad. 
I'll go to this little horse. She's six years old. I've raised her since she was a baby. She'll never be a ridden horse. I'll never betray her trust. If I'm sad, I'll sit at her feet and she'll restyle my hair. That's what, she... <laughs> <laughs> what does she know? But if I'm just being needy and I want a bit of affection, I'll go and sit at her feet. She'll go, yeah, right. Um, how do they know? How do they pick up on our on our emotion? So amazingly, so honestly, yeah. Incredible. We have two kelpies, a part of the horse, and sometimes people come for equine therapy and they never leave the kelpies. Dogs are <laughs> an important part of the work as well. So um, yeah. we go with what is. Amazing. Well, Thank you, everyone. Thank you to our wonderful providers today. You've honestly, I've learned so much today. I think you've offered so much insight into all your different kinds of therapies. We will be sending a, a YouTube video link to everyone who registered today. So everyone will receive this. We'll also upload it onto YouTube in general and we'll uh, do a post event summary on the platform as well. So this will be shared uh, through socials too as much as we can. Um, thank you everyone who joined us today, spent their lunchtime with us. Uh, please join us again next week. We have a wonderful webinar on support coordination. We will be talking about everything you need to know about what a support coordinator is, how do I get funding, all of that. So another info-packed webinar to come. Thanks again, everyone. Enjoy your afternoon and we really hope you've enjoyed today. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Great Bye -bye. information. Bye. Thanks, guys.